Okay, with this video, we're going to diagram and talk about our orifice tube system. All the components, a lot of the diagrams are going to be very similar to the TXV system we just covered and talked about. Exception, we're going to have our orifice tube that we're going to talk about the three locations the tube can possibly be in, and then also the location of the accumulator tank. Unlike the receiver dryer, where the receiver dryer is between the condenser outlet and TXV or evaporator inlet, the accumulator tank is going to be between the evaporator outlet and the compressor inlet. So again, we'll start with the compressor. Clutch coil, pulley, our compressor shaft, and the compressor hub. Just like the previous video, one half of the compressor is going to be our low pressure vapor. Other half of the compressor will be our high pressure gas, high pressure vapor. Same thing has to happen with this compressor as the compressor from our TXV video. We need ground and we need power. Turn the compressor on, create a magnetic field in the clutch coil, force the hub to lock in solid to the pulley. Again, forcing the compressor to start rotating. Sucking and pumping, sucking and compressing. Okay? Our condenser, we have our high side line, which is high pressure gas. Again, going into the upper portion of the condenser. Which again is high pressure gas. Function of the fan, again whether it's electric or mechanical fan moves airflow across the condenser. As it moves airflow across the condenser, it's releasing the heat that's suspended in the high pressure gas. Again, if I have 165 degrees Fahrenheit compared to 95 degree Fahrenheit ambient temperature, there's our heat exchange. Okay. So we've released the heat in the high pressure gas. It is now lower portion of the condenser, high pressure liquid. Leaving the condenser, moving to our evaporator core. Now, I want to stop here for just a second. I want to talk about the orifice tube. Again, the orifice tube, depending on the system, can be located in one of three places. It can be located condenser outlet, could be fixed in the liquid line, or Our evaporator core could be in the inlet tube to the evaporator core. So we have one of three places. Condenser outlet, fixed in the liquid line, or evap inlet.
Now, anytime we service any orifice tube system, anytime that there's any compressor failure, um, internally the lines can come apart. One of the things that we mentioned and we talked about with the orifice tube, the orifice tube resembles a filter. It has a screen. These components are notorious for getting restricted, getting plugged with uh, debris from the compressor, debris from the hoses, debris from the system, period. Okay? Um, very common problem that we encounter on orifice tube systems. Okay? Um, the orifice tube, when it's in the condenser outlet, um, can be removed. Orifice tube, when it's in the evaporator inlet, can be removed. If it's fixed in the high side line between the condenser and the evaporator core, most cases you have to replace that line. There are some examples where you can, or some vehicles where you can replace that orifice tube if it's fixed between the condenser and the evaporator core, but again, most cases you're going to replace that orifice tube. Um, I personally, there are actually um, some kits you can purchase um, that are sold aftermarket where you can splice into the aluminum, aluminum section of the tube of the line where you can splice in an orifice tube. I do not recommend it personally. I replace the line. I've seen more issues trying to splice into these tubes than I have with you replacing the entire line. I personally recommend replacing the line. Um, there are also some tools available on the aftermarket where you can purchase to remove the orifice tubes. If you're lucky, the tool works. A lot of times it does not. The orifice tubes are prone for season in the evaporator inlet and the condenser outlet. Okay? Um, lab exercise, I'll show you some ways to remove both of these. But again, that's a common problem you'll encounter if you're replacing the orifice tube in one of these two locations. They do tend to get stuck in the tubes. Again, the orifice tube is a fixed diameter restriction. Works very similar to the thermal expansion valve. Again, the difference is that restriction, that diameter of that tube is fixed unless we're using a variable orifice tube or an electronic orifice tube. But for most cases, you'll be using a fixed diameter tube. Okay? So again, one of the drawbacks to an orifice tube system is it cannot respond, the orifice tube cannot respond to evaporator load. In other words, heat load from the passenger vehicle to allow more refrigerant moving in an evaporator to help cool the vehicle quicker. So, anytime that we move our liquid, our high pressure liquid, across the restriction, what does it force the high pressure liquid to do? It forces it to change states. So, for example, if the orifice tube were fixed in the condenser outlet, we would start seeing our change in state from our high pressure liquid to our low pressure liquid. If the orifice tube is fixed, we would actually have high pressure liquid up to this point of the tube. After the orifice tube fixed in the liquid line, then it would start changing to our low pressure liquid. If the orifice tube is fixed in the evaporator inlet, again, we would have our high pressure liquid up to the orifice tube at the evaporator inlet, and then it would start changing states after the orifice tube, moving into lower portion of the evaporator core. And if the blower motor is doing its job, again, it's drawing the air from the passenger compartment across the lower portion of the evaporator core. The low pressure liquid is now absorbing the heat from the passenger compartment, forces it to boil, absorbing the heat from the passenger compartment. Low pressure vapor. Leaving the evaporator core, now this is where our accumulator tank comes into play. We have our accumulator tank attached to the evaporator outlet. Move these wires out the way. So now we have low pressure 
vapor, leaving the evaporator core, fill in the accumulator tank. Also, at the same time, again, accumulator tank resembles a cylinder. Lower portion of the, of the accumulator tank, low pressure liquid. This is actually a little reserve of additional refrigerant the system may need. Remember, one of the designs of the accumulator tank that we talked about actually has a tube that loops into the bottom of the accumulator tank that allows only low pressure vapor to leave the accumulator tank going toward the compressor. One other thing to mention, at the bottom of the tube, there's actually a screen or a filter, if you will, and there's a tiny little hole behind that filter in the bottom of that tube that will also allow for some additional oil to be picked up and drawn. There's some oil droplets, if you will, that's suspended in the refrigerant in the bottom of the accumulator tank. And as the refrigerant migrates through the tube going toward the compressor, the oil actually will go through that little hole in the tube and help move oil to the compressor. So now we have our suction line coming from the evaporator core going to our compressor. And our suction line low pressure gas in the same direction of flow for our cumulator tank system, our orifice tube system, as the receiver dryer system. We have our direction of flow. Suction going to the compressor. Being compressed, leaving the compressor. Moving to and through the condenser. Leaving the condenser, moving to and through the evaporator core across the orifice, one of the three locations it could be in. Okay. Um, one other thing that I do want to mention about the accumulator tank, that's a great place for us to install a low pressure switch. Most of your accumulator tank systems will have a low pressure switch that will thread onto the accumulator tank. And think about it for just a second. We talked about our temperature and our pressure relationship chart. And I've mentioned the lower the temperature, the closer the relationship to pressure. So if we have a temperature of approximately 30 degrees Fahrenheit, the evaporator core, be very close to 30 psi of pressure. Anytime that we're below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, what do we have a tendency to do? Things will freeze. Water is constant on the evaporator core. If the evaporator core, the system is functioning like it should, we have our moisture that's moving across the evaporator core, draining down the evaporator core. If it stays below 32 degrees Fahrenheit for any period of time, it will freeze the evaporator core. It will become a block of ice. So the goal here is to cycle the compressor, turn it off and on. So if I have a pressure switch that I can install on the accumulator tank that's exposed to the vapor that's exiting the evaporator core, that would be a very good component for me to use to shut the compressor off to allow the pressure to rise in the evaporator core. If the pressure rises in the evaporator core, so will the temperature. So if my pressure goes up now to 34 PSI, now I'm above what my temperature is, roughly 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that gonna keep my evaporator from freezing? Absolutely. And the pressure switch has cut in and cut out contacts in it, and it's set at a certain pressure. 
Um, most of your pressure switches will cut out, depending on the manufacturer, anywhere between about 22 to 28 PSI, and they'll come back in anywhere between about 38 to 42, P, uh, 42 uh, PSI pressure. Okay, So we can cycle the compressor at that range. We shut the compressor off, allows the temperature to rise in the evaporator core to keep the evaporator from freezing. Okay.